The irony of fate if my administration were consumed by foreign affairs. Well, it was, of course, a tragic irony of fate, but of course that is exactly what happens by the second administration. On April 2nd, 1917, Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany. In this famous war message, he minted what would become an enduring theme in American foreign policy. The world must be made safe for democracy. I shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free. That's how he ended the speech. It was really one of the great speeches in American history. From the beginning of America's involvement in the war, Wilson was focused on his vision for the peace. And central to that vision was his idea for the League of Nations, an international body that could settle disputes without bloodshed and bring an end to war. The League would become his great obsession. As a war president, Wilson mostly kept his hands off and let U.S. Army General John Blackjack Pershing take care of the details. John J. Pershing said that uh, Woodrow Wilson gave him only one order, maintain a separate American army. Wilson had brought the United States into the war late and for our own reasons. And one of the ways to make sure that we emphasized how separate our commitment to the war was, was to keep a separate army. The first family aided the war effort by grazing sheep on the White House lawn and auctioning off the wool to raise money for the Red Cross. But the man who sought to make the world safe for democracy turned a blind eye to democratic suppression at home when Congress passed the Sedition and Espionage Acts of 1918, which made it a crime to criticize the government. Wilson really did not set this in motion in a direct way, but he acquiesced in the suppression of fundamental civil liberties for the duration of the war. Overseas, the arrival of the American army proved decisive for the Allies. 19 months after Wilson declared war, Germany surrendered. The final terms of the peace would be decided at a conference in Paris. Although no sitting U.S. president had ever traveled to Europe, there was no question that Woodrow Wilson would make the trip. He set sail for France on December 4th, 1918 carrying with him the hopes of the world for a peace that would last for all time. He was greeted rapturously. He was regarded as the embodiment of this fresh new force from the other side of the Atlantic that had brought this horrible bloody conflict to an end. He went to Paris, to London, to Rome, children threw roses at his feet millions of people turned out to see him he was the the hero the savior out of the west wilson had to make many compromises in paris but when the treaty was finally signed at the palace of versailles he had gotten what he wanted most a provision for the establishment of the league of nations still as he sailed for home there was one stumbling block remaining approval by the Republican-controlled U.S. Senate. In Washington, Wilson faced vehement opposition from Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, the powerful Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. When Wilson came home from Paris, he insisted on hand-delivering the treaty to the Senate. And when he got to the Senate door, Henry Cabot Lodge asked Wilson if he could carry in the treaty. And Wilson turned to Lodge and said, not on your life, Senator. Refusing to negotiate with the Senate, Wilson sought to rally public opinion for the treaty. To do so, he set out on a physically demanding cross-country speaking tour. He never listened to his doctor who kept saying, take it easy on this trip, don't strain yourself. He insisted on doing it. He was in Pueblo, Colorado. He suddenly was overcome. It was a physical collapse at that point. And he had to curtail his barnstorming around the country, return to Washington, where he suffered a severe stroke. Wilson really was seriously impaired by that stroke. Uh, from October 1919 till March 1921, um, the United States really didn't have much of a chief executive in Woodrow Wilson. Edith Wilson was fiercely protective of her husband. She kept most visitors away and tried to cover up the severity of his condition. 
She also took it upon herself to relay important matters of state to the president and report back on what Wilson was thinking. For the 18 months remaining the presidency, one could almost say that indeed Mrs. Wilson was a kind of president. It was an extraordinary moment in American history. Wilson's illness clearly, clearly contributed to the political gridlock that spread over the Capitol at this terribly crucial moment with the League and the Treaty at stake. On March 19th, 1920, the ailing president was informed that the treaty and therefore the League of Nations had met its final defeat in the Senate. He replied, they have shamed us in the eyes of the world. Wilson's failure to compromise had far-reaching implications. Without U.S. support, the League of Nations proved ineffective, setting the stage for another generation to fight another world war. I happen to think if Wilson had been healthy, he would have given enough ground so that the Senate would have had to go along with the Treaty of Versailles. The United States would have joined the League of Nations, and the course of world history over the next 20 years might have been materially different. Despite his failure to get the treaty ratified, Woodrow Wilson had succeeded in laying the cornerstone for a new relationship between America and the world. That idea of what the proper role of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the world ought to be, Wilson Miller is the first president to grapple with that whole set of problems and ideas. And, you know, we're still trying to sort that out today. Woodrow Wilson appeared on the $100,000 bill, the largest American denomination ever printed. Never circulated, it was only used by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department.